Hi, fellow caregivers, and welcome to Managing Mental Health, or MMH for short. I'm Renee. We're here to provide uh, information and tools to help you cope with the day-to-day -day struggles so many of us face as caregivers. Uh, our team of licensed caregivers provides new videos weekly. Sometimes we'll do even more than one a week. And our focus is on three different categories, age-related illnesses, such as Alzheimer's and dementia, mental illness, and mental disorders, because those can be very different things, and also uh, traumatic brain injury, which is known as a TBI. Uh, brain injuries result in some level of brain damage, just depends on the situation, depends on the severity of the damage. So let's go ahead and jump in. We take uh, as many questions as we can from our website each week. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. But before we do that, please remember that we're not doctors and we're not clinicians. We all have a great deal of experience caregiving. I took care of my mom uh, during her bout with Alzheimer's until she passed in 2010. It's kind of unrelated. I assisted taking care of my dad uh, during the time he passed of cancer many years ago. And then my oldest sister, who is severely mentally ill, um, she has lived with me, I've been her caregiver for years, and also my middle sister, who suffered a really horrible um, airplane crash 40 years ago and has severe brain damage. So, uh, while I might not be a doctor or a clinician, I certainly have some experience that I can bring forward and share with you guys. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at our first question. Uh, as, as I'm going through the questions and picking out our first question, just know that you guys are all wonderful. You're fabulous. You're doing a, a terrific job. Caregiving is very difficult. It takes a special person to do it. So keep up the good work, you guys. Okay, our first question comes from Kathy in San Diego. It says, my dad has Alzheimer's and wanders off. I don't want to put him in a home, but I wonder if I should. This is a highly personal question. I have friends who immediately put their families in homes. Uh, I have other friends who never put their families in homes. I tried putting my mom in a home for a short time and I found that that was very unsuccessful for us. I'm extremely blessed and fortunate. I'm self-employed. Welcome to my home office. You know, I've had the same office for over 30 years. So uh, it does give me a little more flexibility and leeway as far as providing care for family members and still holding down a career, running my household, raising my kids, and so forth. My kids are now full grown, so I don't have that anymore. Uh, okay, so let's let's talk about putting your loved one in a home. When my mom came down with Alzheimer's, and let me backtrack, because we, we get this question a minimum of five times a week on our website. What's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? The difference is Alzheimer's, and I please don't anybody take offense at this, I'm just going to Put it out there real quickly for you. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease, meaning it's not going to get better. It's probably going to, it's not probably, it's going to get worse. Um, there might be some medications out there that will help slow the progress of it, but at this point there is no cure for Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. Dementia is a consequence of something, either a disease or an injury, and there may be other reasons that a person can develop a dementia. Uh, my sister had dementia at the point of her accident. She had a severe head injury, instant dementia, just like that. She's in her late 60s now, so now she has age-related dementia. My mom had uh, Alzheimer's and dementia set in for that as well. So, um, is it time to put your loved one in a home? I'll share my personal experience with you in regard to that. What I will tell you is there are some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful homes out there and uh, many of them are extremely expensive so you have to be kind of prepared for how much you're able to spend if you're looking at that option if there is no long-term care insurance if there isn't any long-term care insurance it's something that i think we're all well served to to look into and we're motivated to do it especially after we provide care for a loved one because it right now i think that for a really nice place you're going to look at 50 or sixty thousand dollars a year and that's more that's more than the median income is so taking that into consideration there are a lot of placement agencies and I'm not going to name any of them and I don't think any are like super awesome great and I don't think any are really horrible bad either but there are lots and lots of placement agencies what I can tell you has been my personal experience is that they don't, they don't really have the time to vet 
every facility they might recommend for you. So they have a, a laundry list, you know, what's your zip code, what's your budget, what's the condition of your loved one, etc. And then they're going to go off of that. I, it is my opinion that these companies who are placement agencies, again, many of them are wonderful and awesome and loving and caring, but they don't go and look at every single home. Um, I mean, they just can't when they're dealing with thousands of homes they can place people in because many of these facilities are, are nationwide. Again, lots of them are wonderful, caring, loving, good, good places. And so you guys know how they are compensated. Uh, placement agencies have agreements with all these different homes and the placement agency is paid the first month typically it's just the first month of your family members stay there so if it's five thousand dollars a month that agency gets five thousand dollars for placing you there some agencies only take half of the first month and so on um, some of them recommend super great places and some recommend places that i i i would not put a loved one um, what you really have to do and this is again this i'm just talking from my own personal experience what you really should do is one if you pick the once you pick a home out for your loved one if the owner or the management company says oh uh, we don't accept pop-in visitors just ignore that and pop in whenever you want if that's a problem i'd probably move my loved one uh, i found a home and i found it through one of these agencies and it was a beautiful house it was privately owned the owner was a nurse I'm not going to tell you what city or where or anything else, but um, the owner was a nurse, so that was impressive to me. She had a medical background. Uh, I believe it was her nephew who was one of the primary caregivers. And when you walked out, you drove up to the house. It was neat. It was clean. The yard was well maintained. You walked in. Uh, the furnishings were completely appropriate for this type of facility. I think they had like six people there. Um, and it all just looked wonderful. So I continued to pop by and pop by and pop in. And one night I popped in and um, they were having dinner. And now I come from a family where you ate meat and potatoes and at least two vegetables and a salad with every dinner. That's just the way it was. It was healthy and that's how I was raised. So that's, you know, and I explained all this to that particular home before I put my mom there. And uh, I walked in one night and they had uh, four or five, little old ladies sitting around the table having dinner and dinner consisted i swear i'm not kidding you guys dinner consisted of a hot dog on a plain bun a box of juice like you would put in a child's lunch which is silly because the adult squeezes it and you know the juice goes everywhere um and a fruit cup and i thought my goodness that does not look like a good meal to me um the caregiver was helping to feed many of these residents my mother was self-feeding and but my mother didn't eat hot dogs she had she, she was very health conscious and so that to her was was not dinner um and the i'll never forget this one woman at the end of the table she was a much much older gal i'd put her somewhere in her 80s and the caregiver picked up the hot dog and put it to her mouth for her to take a bite and he shoved just a huge amount like a fourth of his hot dog into her mouth and she struggled and struggled and struggled and finally got that down and then he went to give her another bite in the same manner and she had trouble speaking and so she was trying to say it's too much it's too much he said oh you're full that's too much food he took her paper plate and the balance of her hot dog and threw it in the trash well what this poor woman meant was that was too much in one bite but the caregiver wasn't aware of what this woman was saying and it, my heart just broke for the people in this home i and i'd had some other little issues with that home my mom had developed uh, two little bed sores and she'd never had a bed sore in her life and she'd only been there two weeks and so between the small bed sores they weren't even the size of like a pencil eraser but they were still bed sores and bed sores don't get better they only get worse you can manage them, but they're not going to go away typically. Um, so that night, the night of the hot dogs, I gathered my mother's things out of her room. I packed them up in my car and I took her and I took her home with me. Now, 
there are other facilities. There was another facility that I particularly loved for my mother. Um, but honestly, she didn't have long-term care insurance and this home was $65,000 a year. And it's just, that's a huge amount of money for a home. And I thought, you know, I'm just gonna take her home with me and I can hire help for much less than that. And so that was the path that we took. Um, again, there are some wonderful, wonderful homes out there, but what I would encourage everybody to do who puts a loved one in a home is go by there frequently, go by there unannounced, check up on them, go at meal time, go at bath time, and just double check and verify that your loved one is getting the appropriate care um, that you want for them and that you feel that you are paying for. So that, that's my answer there. But again, it's, it's completely personal. Um, one of my, my girlfriend's dad uh, had Alzheimer's and he was a huge man. He stood maybe 6'5", just a big, big, big guy. And his wife was this tiny little gal. Well, she couldn't care for him. And so my girlfriend and her mom went shopping for one of these homes and she knows what I do. And so I worked with her a little bit on that and they just put together a schedule to go in and visit. So this woman has one adult brother plus her mom. So there were three of them and they divvied it up. And every other day, roughly, somebody was by that home at a different time in the day, checking to make sure that their father was getting the appropriate care. So you guys have all the power. Go to the home, check on the home, be friendly, be polite. Um, you know, it's, it's just prudent in my opinion. Again, I'm not a doctor, not a clinician, but it, in my opinion, is prudent to uh, check on them regularly, particularly when you first put them in a home. So good luck with that. My heart breaks for you. I know that's such a tough decision, but um, just based on the way you, you wrote your question, you sound like such a caring, loving person. I am sure that you're going to make the right decision for your family. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Our next question that we're going to do today. Uh, do you have, this is when you have your, your loved one at home. It's not necessarily always a parent. It could be a child and it could be, in my case, with the diapers is a sibling. Um, my sister who has brain damage from an accident wears diapers 24-7. And this question is from Stephanie in San Diego. And she says, do you have any suggestions for managing adult diapers? What we do is that we, I have a trash can that's about, you know, a um, foot and a half tall, maybe about that big around. Big enough that it can hold diapers, but if a diaper is fully saturated, th that's very heavy. And so you don't want to have to struggle to the trash with this bag of diapers. So whether it's me or her, one of my sister's caregivers, because when I go on an appointment, um, then I have a caregiver come in and stay with my sister while I'm gone. So we put, we, we open up a plastic bag, and this is really important. It's, it's simple little things that you can do that really help. We put a plastic bag in her trash can. Let me rephrase that. She puts a plastic bag in her trash can. So if your loved one has the capacity to do certain things for themselves, encourage it because the more you do for them that they can actually do for themselves, uh, the less they will do for themselves. So again, the more you encourage them to do, the more they will do. If I would, <laughs> If I would do everything for my sister, she would turn me into her slave. So you don't want to do that. So I put the um, clean plastic trash bag out and I always open it up for her. Otherwise, she looks at it and tells me it's defective and it's just a sheet of plastic. So you kind of open the bag up and you lay it on top of the full diaper pail. Again, diaper pail should have a lid so it doesn't cause odor to move through your house. And whether again it's me or whether it's one of her caregivers when she goes in the bathroom in the morning we'll say please take that bag you know talking through the door so she has her privacy please take that bag of diapers out of the can tie it closed you have to repeat these directions to her at least three times and generally i'm going to say probably about five times again her dementia is horrible her brain damage is horrible but she eventually gets that bag out of the can she ties it closed in a knot and puts it by the bathroom door she then puts the new bag into the can. And then we have to remind her, close the lid. You have to close the lid. As soon as she leaves the bathroom, whether it's me or whether it's a caregiver, uh, we, 
put on a pair of gloves and we take that bag of diapers immediately to the trash can, put it in the trash can, leave the gloves behind with it, and then that's it. What you don't want to do is let the diapers stack up because that will be very, very unpleasant for your entire household. Um, I am very, uh, my nature is to be very organized and if you guys can be super organized, it will help you. So every single morning we go through the same exact pattern with her. And even though she forgets, um, she remembers little pieces of it. So have that same pattern, have that bag out. Every morning um, there will be at least two diapers placed out for my sister because she doesn't have the capacity. If we give her 10, she'll use 10. She'll go in the bathroom and every few minutes and she'll change her diaper every single time. So we have to manage how many she has. Um, and then also just very quickly, so it's the same exact pattern every morning. It kind of helps them remember. So hopefully that will help you. There are diaper services. I personally wouldn't want to uh, deal with that because you have to keep an awful lot of diapers around your house. It's kind of like they did with baby diapers. And those are typically going to be cloth. And you definitely don't want to deal with a cloth diaper on an adult. Um, when my mom was, I, I'm going to say in the last two weeks of her life, she too was in diapers and hospice came hospice is like having angels in your house they are wonderful as soon as your doctor prescribes um, or diagnoses your loved one and i say this with nothing but love and kindness for you in my heart as soon as there is a diagnosis that your loved one is going to pass then hospice uh, will come in and most insurances will pay for it at that time so as soon as you get that diagnos diagnosis, hospice will be there. And if diapers are needed for your loved one, then hospice will take care of that. If in fact your loved one is completely bedridden, then I would encourage you, if at all possible, to get help. Um, someone who can come in for a couple of hours every day to at least give you a break. In many cases, insurances will pay for that depending on which state you live in. Many states will give you a credit of some type uh, where you can pay for a caregiver to come in and give you assistance. So look at all those different options you guys have because that's that's diapers are a tough one. Okay, so next question. This comes from Susan in Los Angeles. And she says, should I tell my kids about their grandmother's Alzheimer's or should I shield them from her illness? This is a lot like putting a loved one in a home. This is an extremely personal decision. I have friends who said, oh, no, 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 I never told my kids. Oh, and depending on their age, my personal belief is you want to be honest with your kids and it, it just depends on their age so it should always be age appropriate if they're really 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 little then you explain that grandma is sick um, and everybody loves her and is going to help take care of her when you have children in the home having that child feel needed and participatory in the care of the loved one even if it's the grandma it makes them feel connected to the family so it makes the child or the grandchild feel connected now when my mom when I was taking care of my mom my oldest granddaughter was two cute as a button two years old and I would give her like a little washcloth and she would carry that into my mom's room she'd follow along behind me while I was helping my mom walk or you know until my mom got into a wheelchair um, and she would carry that little washcloth and that was her job was to carry that washcloth and you could see the pride in this child and it's just like oh that was so sweet and you're such a help and great grand thanks you so much for carrying her clean washcloths into her room i didn't leave the washcloth in the room but my granddaughter just took so much pride in doing that now my sons were quite a bit older so they had their tasks and my oldest son was in his 20s. My youngest was still a minor. And so naturally, I'm going to be completely candid with my children. Um, for me, we looked up definitions together, what the illness consisted of, what we could expect. I like to be prepared. I like to know what's ahead of me. And so I prepared with my children, and they were extremely helpful. The more information I gave them, the more empowered they became to help. Um, and then again, by engaging family members, no matter how trivial the assistance might be, 
it makes them feel connected to the family. And that sense of connection and belonging is huge in creating a, a positive self-esteem in your kids. And all families go through certain things. Um, you know, some families go through one type of situation while other families will go through another type. But what we always want to remember is that having family is fabulous. You could be in this world all alone, completely by yourself, and wouldn't that be icky? Uh, I'm just so grateful to have my, my parents for the time that I had them and my siblings, even though they're both quite ill. And I'm super grateful for my children. So I would just tell them what a fabulous job they did. It was real cute because my mom was a little bit bigger than I am. And so I couldn't lift her. And she'd had several small strokes. And my son's job was to help grandma to bed because I couldn't carry her and she didn't walk well and she didn't want to be in a wheelchair. So they had the job of, of helping grandma get in bed and it was really quite quite sweet and they took a lot of pride in being helpful in that regard. Um, when the children are much younger, again, you're going to tell them something that is age appropriate. And also you need to gauge what you say to your child, in my opinion, I'm not a doctor, uh, but you do need to gauge it based somewhat on how that child deals with things. Like my sons are night and day. They are polar opposites personality wise. They take stress differently. They take uh, bad news differently. And so I would try to gauge my explanation to my sons based on how they would receive it, um, how well they would receive it. So I find that being very matter of fact, stating the facts, uh, Alzheimer's is based on this. Here's how it affects the brain. It does get worse over time, but we're here for grandma and we love her and we are going to take care of her. And I'm just so proud of you guys for helping me take care of your grandma. And it is do it that way. Now, if you're not comfortable sharing it with your children, then I would suggest that you talk with perhaps a therapist and get some insight as to the best way to approach the situation if you don't want to be completely candid with your children. So that is up to you. And I wish you well. It's a tough conversation, no matter who you're having that conversation with. Okay, so I'm checking to see how we're doing on time today. All right, and our next question comes from Becky. And I'm not sure where she's from. And it says, um, our son was born with a handicap. And my husband feels like we should take him everywhere we go but he has behavioral issues. What is your opinion? Oh, God bless you. That's just such a hard, hard situation. Again, I respect everybody's opinion. Everybody has a right to their own opinion on this matter. I watched my parents struggle with taking my sister everywhere after her accident and her severe brain damage. And she'd have temper tantrums and she'd make terrible scenes out in public and it was just so stressful for my parents and it was stressful for any of the other family members that attended whatever the event was, um, or even just a simple dinner or going to church, something like that. They took her everywhere. They felt obligated. They felt, I think with parents, I think parents feel, and forgive me, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I do think parents feel more guilt than say siblings. We don't feel nearly the guilt that a parent might feel. And so my parents would take my sister everywhere out of guilt. And it was just terrible. It was horrible. Something to bear in mind, it, 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 and it depends on the handicap, and you didn't give me a lot of detail about your child. Um, it depends on whether your child has short-term memory, whether your child has the ability to speak or not. Um, what I realized in watching my parents is... They were doing this out of, out of their love for my sister, wanting her to have a normal life, struggling desperately to find some degree of normalcy for her after her accident. Now, it's going to be different when your child is born with a handicap, so normal for them is going to be different than normal for someone who's in an accident or, or develops an illness. Um, if it is a tremendous, if your child knows what you're doing, if they know where they're going, if they enjoy their time, then I'd say yes, that's probably a good idea to take them. I would weigh and measure where I took them. Um, I know with, with many children who have handicaps or who are challenged, uh, noise might be upsetting for them. 
uh, a certain type of lighting could be upsetting for them. So you want to weigh and measure what kind of environment does my child do well in? What kind of environment is my child comfortable in? Is taking my child causing him or her more stress than it's actually worth? Now, again, I don't know if your child has much memory um, or what their mental capacity actually is, but for my sister, she has no short-term memory. And when I tell you guys no short, I mean, I'm. why are you walking across the hall, Yolanda? She has no idea. She forgets why she's going across the hallway for something. And so what I came to terms with, and it took me a long time to do this, but I would take her everywhere I went because that's what I saw my parents do. But then what I eventually came to terms with is she didn't remember where I took her. She was incredibly stressed out um, because there are so many challenges with my sister's handicap and depending on the, the degree of challenge to take your child somewhere, um, I, th that I would think would layer into how much stress it causes them. At this point in life for my sister, her handicap is so severe that she gets so stressed out by doing the little bit she does to get herself ready to go and then I have to finish getting her ready to go and then I have to get her into her wheelchair and get her out to the to the car and, and so that whole process is very 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 challenging it exhausts her and two minutes after we walk out of the restaurant or walk out of church or walk out of a store or wherever we've been she does not know where she was she has no memory of it whatsoever so if your child doesn't have memory of it and it is causing stress and if they do tend to cause a lot of attention by inappropriate behavior in public then I would really sit down and say are you I would ask myself this question am I doing this for my sister or for your child or am I doing it because I feel like it's what I'm supposed to do? So really back up and evaluate that question. Is it because it's doing your child good, your child is benefiting from the experience, then take them. Just weigh and measure where you take them. If it's causing tremendous stress, your child doesn't remember it, they're upset and they crash and sleep for two days after they get home from that particular outing, don't take them. You know, take them outside, take them to the park. There are a lot of things you can still do with them because you certainly would never want a loved one to become a prisoner in their room. And this is probably something that you guys, God bless you, God bless you. You know, you guys are wonderful people for taking care of your child. This is probably something you will do forever, you know, forever. So if that is the case, then really something that helps me is try to back up and be very, very pragmatic about it. Lay it out in a list. Does he or she remember it? Is it beneficial? What is the overall experience like? How much time did it take? What was the experience like coming home? And what is the experience like after they've been home for a while? And really look at everything very clinically and weigh and measure each aspect. And then the two of you can make a decision as to whether or not it's prudent for you to continue to take your child to these public places with you. Um, God bless you. And you know, I'll say a prayer for you guys. I know that that is just a long, long, uh, difficult road to, to walk. I would suggest if you haven't, you know, look into whatever you know, state you live in. We're here in California and there are so many wonderful programs. Perhaps there are some areas or some, some organizations where you could take your child, where there are children of similar um, or who were in a similar situation and have similar or the same um, condition. And that might be just a little bit easier for everybody involved. But again, God bless you. I'll say a prayer for you guys. You're doing a great job. You know, caregiving comes from the heart. It absolutely does. So hang in there. And um, I think you guys are, it sounds like you guys are doing a great job. Okay, we have come to the end of our time for today, so we hope this information has helped you. If you'd like to submit a question, please go to www.managingmentalhealth.com and click on Submit Question and follow the link. While you're on our website, please become a member or a sponsoring member. Membership provides access to uh, Let's Talk, Meet Me at the Kitchen Table, and also Co-op Care, which is a based on a proprietary software that we developed and it matches people up 
uh, to share caregiving services. That's what the co-op care is. And also just to have somebody who is walking in the same shoes you're walking in. You can meet them at the kitchen table figuratively, uh, talk with them, visit with them, get to know them, and just have somebody that you can share your experiences with. Also, you membership also provides access to crisis management. So if your family is in crisis, um, you can always email us from the website, which again is www.managingmentalhealth.com. But what I would suggest you do if you're truly in crisis is pick up your phone and call us. We're here. We're here for our um, fellow caregivers and for the caregiving community. You can always reach us at 888-929-9828. Again, that's 888-929-9828. You can also go to our website and find that number as well. And uh, give us a call. One of our team members will get right back to you if you do go to our voicemail. Uh, so anything we can do to help, we do provide the consulting services for uh, developing inclusive caregiving plans that include really creating a roadmap. You know, where is your family right now in regard to caregiving? Where is your loved one? What's their situation? What are the potential outcomes of the situation they're in? How much time does your care require? How, how much money does, what is it the cost with that care going to be? It, and with the utmost of love and respect, what is the life expectancy you're dealing with? And so we really sit down and create a roadmap for um, people who just need help. If somebody had approached my parents 40 years ago after my sister's accident, it could have, it, it, it could have been life altering for all of us, including for my sister. So all of you caregivers, hang in there. You're all fabulous. You're all wonderful and doing a great job. I understand the pressure you feel, um, but hang in there. Prayer helps. If you're having a super hard time of it, prayer always helps. So until next time, continue living, loving, and caring. And bye-bye for now.